Moon today is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost in Kentucky. And also the day we begin tomorrow, we begin uh, probably our, four, our new school year after finishing three retreats in a row. And now we begin the classes uh, tomorrow and have uh, t 21 seminarians for the classes tomorrow. And uh, one is still uh, ready to ready to come and still not yet here we're 21 to start tomorrow so pray for the seminarians starting this new school year and that uh, the epistle for this 19th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's letter to Ephesians chapter 4 brethren be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which has been created according to God in justice and holiness of truth Wherefore, put away lying and speak truth, each one with his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your anger. Do not give place to the devil. He who is wont to steal, let him steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands at what is good, that he may have something to share with him who suffers need. In the Gospel. And then we're in the same Matthew chapter 22. At that time, Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees uh, in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a king who made a marriage feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call in those invited to the marriage feast, and they would not come. Again, he sent other uh, servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatlings are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it, and went off one to his farm, and another to his business, and the rest laid hold of his servants, and treated them shamefully, and killed them. But when the king heard of it, he was angry, and he sent his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, The marriage feast indeed is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the crossroads and invite to the marriage feast whomsoever you will shall find. And the servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. And the marriage feast was filled with guests. Now the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he said to them, Friend, how didst thou come in here without a wedding garment? But he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him forth into the exterior darkness, for there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And so the words of today is holy God. Father's only goes to death. This 19th Sunday after Pentecost, the uh, 19th Sunday after Pentecost, we read in the scripture about the great Judas Maccabeus. We are now headed into the time of the Maccabees in the history of our church today. And Judas Maccabeus, Judas the Hammer, he's called the Maccabee because he's the Hammer, he was called the Hammer, was the greatest warrior, the greatest soldier, one of the greatest soldiers of all time. And he was a priest and a soldier. And what is needed now as we enter into this time of the crisis of the church, priests and soldiers. When we read today in the sacred scripture, about the day that Judas Maccabeus first wept. But before we get to it, we find that he was there in a, in a, in a field, and he found that his enemies under Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a symbol of the Antichrist, was coming to defeat him and his army. He had an army, but he did not have the weapons of war. And he found that four or five thousand foot soldiers and one thousand horsemen from the Emperor Gorgias 
was going from the general Gorgias was coming to attack him in the night. He fled in the night. He took his soldiers and they went and hid themselves in the night. And Gorgias came into the camp. And he came in and saw that there were no soldiers there. And they said, Judas has fled. Judas is afraid. Where is the enemy that we have come to capture? But he heard word of their attack in the night. And he did not fight in the night. The next day, he gathered his 3,000 men. And they gathered in the plain of the field, and they went up to the enemy, 5,000 foot soldiers and 1,000 horsemen. And he gathered an army before them. Only he had two problems. His soldiers had no swords, and they had no shields. And 3,000 men without weapons, without defense, stood in the battlefield. And they stood open, that they might be seen plainly by the enemy. And Gorgias saw, this is the army that I am going to fight. They don't even have swords or shields. They would have had a better chance had they fought at night and used guerrilla warfare tactics. But these were not the tactics of Judas the Hammer. He stood in front of his army and he said, Remember that our ancestors crossed the Red Sea and destroyed the enemy of Pharaoh. His whole army was wiped out. It is God who fights for us, and we fight for God. Therefore, be not afraid of their breastplates and their armor, which shine in the light. Be not afraid of their swords. For God shall have mercy on this day, and deliver these men into our hands. And they charged. 3,000 men without uniforms, without swords, without shields. They charged behind Judas straight into the camp of the enemy, and they killed 3,000 of the 5,000 men, of the 6,000 men, 5,000 foot soldiers and 1,000 men, 1,000 horsemen. But then they chased him into the night. And then Gorgias went to the said, we, we cannot defeat them, so easily, so we will gather a larger army. And they gathered together a larger army, this time 60,000 men. Then Judas went and met them at 10,000. And he wiped them out. And Gorgias had to flee the battlefield with another 5,000 dead. And they fled back to Antiochus and said, we have to gather even more men in order to defeat this man. And then Judas went to his soldiers and they said, Behold, the enemy is discomfited. And here is where the sacred scripture picks up today. Chapter 4 of the book of first book of Maccabees. The last two books of the Old Testament. And the ones that apply to our times. And Judas, then Judas and his brethren said, Behold, our enemies are discomfited. Let us go up now to cleanse the holy place and to repair them. The holy places and to repair them. And all the army assembled together. And they went up into the Mount Sinai. And they saw the sanctuary desolate, and the altar profaned, and the gates burnt, and the shrubs and shrubs growing up to the, uh, into the, in the courts, as in a forest, or on the mountains, and the chambers joining to the temple thrown down. And they rent their garments, and they made great lamentation, and put ashes upon their heads. And they fell down to the ground on their faces, and they sounded the, with the trumpets the alarm, and they cried towards heaven. Then Judas appointed men to fight against them that were in the castle, till they had cleansed the holy places. And to those priests, and, and, the, and, he, and he chose priests without blemish, whose will 
was set upon the law of God, and they cleansed the holy places and took away the stones that had been uh, defiled into an unclean place. And he considered about the altar of the holocausts that had been profaned, what he should do with it. And a good counsel came, uh, came into their minds to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them because the Gentiles had defiled it and, and they threw it down. And they laid up the, the stones in the, mount, in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place till there should come a prophet to give an answer concerning them. Then they took, uh, the, the, took whole stones according to the law and built a new altar according to the former. And they built up the holy places and the things that were within the temple and they sanctified the temple and the courts. And they, made, uh, and they made new holy vessels, and brought in the candlestick, and the altar of incense, and the table within, and into the temple. And they put incense upon the altar, and they lighted up the lamps this, uh, <clears throat> that were upon the, the candlesticks, and they gave light in the temple. And they set uh, the, the, the loaves upon the table. And, and, and hung up the, vest, the veils and, fini and, furnished, and finished all the works that they had begun to make. And they arose before the morning on the five and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is the month of Kazlu, to the, to, uh, in the hundred and forty-eighth year. And they offered sacrifice according to the law upon the new altar of holocaust which they had made. This is the time in which we now enter. The time of the sacred Maccabees. And also it teaches us how we are to fight whenever the church is in the most grave crisis. First we note about the heart of Judas Maccabeus. He had 3,000 men and he had no weapons. He told them, don't worry about the enemy. Charge them and destroy them. And he did not sound the alarm. But when that same Judas Maccabeus came into the temple of God, and he saw that it was filled with shrubs, and he saw that it was desolate, and he saw that it had been defiled by the Gentiles and also by the Jews, the Jewish priests who offered the false sacrifice of Antiochus Epiphanes in the true temple, the abomination of desolation that was in the holy place. He had a lamentation and a great mourning and they sounded the trumpet and the alarm. We must remember in all times of the history of our church, we must sound the alarm. Now what is the alarm that must be sounded? It is not the alarm about the killing of flesh. We are against the killing of widows. We are against the killing of orphans. We are against the murdering of millions of babies in the womb. We are against euthanasia, and the murdering of the elderly and the sick, and we are against all manner of unjust killing. But we do not sound the alarm about these things. We simply combat them as we meet them and save as many as we can. But what do we, in which do, this, do we sound the alarm? We sound the alarm when our faith is assaulted. We sound the alarm when God is insulted, for there are two tables of the law. And the first table is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole mind, thy whole soul, and thy whole strength. And the second is life unto it. Therefore, if we do not follow the first table of the law, and our hearts are not embracing the first table of the law, it is impossible to follow the second table. And it is a complete waste of time to defend the second table if we do not defend the first. <clears throat> the second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself for the love of God. This is a very small table. It has seven commandments, beginning with honor thy father and mother, and ending with thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. This is a small table easy commandment. And it can only be fulfilled if we follow first the first table of the law. And there is a test 
Who loves the first table of the law? This is the test of the crisis of the church. <clears throat> We're in a great crisis. And sometimes we must understand, we must understand that the first table of the law holds the first place. And there are many families with which God is not well pleased. Many priests with which God is not well pleased. Many soldiers of God with whom God is not well pleased. Because they have not the heart of Judas Maccabeus. His heart was not disturbed. He had 3,000 men without weapons fighting 6,000 trained soldiers in the fullness of their power. He was not disturbed. He slew them easily. And then, and then he continued in battle and defeated his enemies easily. But what is it that caused the great pain in his heart when he saw the abomination of desolation in the holy place? And how did their war begin? How did Judas become a, uh, become a soldier? Because his father, Mattathias, now remember when Mattathias started the fight of the Maccabees. There was sin all over Judea. There was every kind of sin. In the last 500 years, there has been every kind of sin. There has been every kind of idolatry. There has been every kind of impurity, every kind of violence, Every kind of sin has happened since the Protestant Revolution 500 years ago. And there was impurity, and there was nakedness, and they were playing games. They had built gymnasiums all over Israel, and the people turned away from the worship of God, and they went to sports. That's what they did 160 years before Christ was born. They forgot God and went to sports. But then a priest... A priest went up before the people and he offered an abomination of a sacrifice. He offered a full sacrifice to Antiochus Epiphanes as if this man was God. And this is the type of the time will come of the Antichrist. And an old man in his 90s, an old priest, there were many hundreds of thousands of priests. He was just one of them. And his name was Mattathias. And he saw the abomination of desolation in the holy place. Now, there were so many other sins. There were so many other troubles. There was infidelity in the sins against all ten of the commandments. But he tolerated that. But when he saw the abomination of desolation in the holy place, Mattathias saw the priest offering the full sacrifice, and there were hundreds of thousands, several thousands of people, maybe 50,000, 100,000 people at this service. He took a sword. And filled with the zeal of God, he went into the sanctuary and he killed the priest while he was offering the sacrifice. Killed him. And then he turned around, the old man, and he said to all the Jewish people, Though all of Israel, though all of Israel depart from the true God and follow the false gods, I and my sons shall never depart. I and my sons will remain faithful to the true worship. What is the duty of the priest of church, he, of the priest of God? He is first a man of God. What are you supposed to see when you see a priest walk down the street? That is a man of God. He's not a social worker. He is a man of God. He's not even a good social worker. He is a man of God. And when the man of God walks into a room, the thoughts should turn to God. And what is the first thing? God. There are two tables of the law, and the priest knows. The first one is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and thy whole strength and thy whole mind. I hold everything. And the second is very small, which is bigger. God in his infinity, or our little universe? What is more? God in his power, and his dignity, and his wonder, and infinite magnificence in all sides, or the beauty of the little world that he made? The second is likened to it, for why is this world beautiful, and why are men beautiful, and why is the world good? Because it was made by God. We notice two things on each of the days of creation. 
first God worked. He created the earth. He created the rocks. He created the plants. He created man. He created the animals. He created the, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. He first created. He worked. And this is the first duty of the priest. He must work. Remember what St. Paul says, the laborer is worthy of his hire, and the priest is a laborer, and if he does not labor, he is not worthy of his hire. He must first work, and God worked. He created the whole world out of nothing. That takes a lot of work to make everything out of nothing. And then he says to his priest, go out into the world, where there is no knowledge of me, go out into the world where there is no love of me, Go in the world where there is nothing of me and put me there. Isn't it hard, Lord? I saw nothing and created the universe. You go out and put truth and love and the knowledge of God wherever you go. Work. And so he worked and created the world. And then what is the second thing he did? At the end of each day, God looked at what he had done, and he saw that it was good. We must understand, if the eyes of God are not upon us, we see an example just after the scripture today, Jonathan and another man, he said, Judas is whacking the bad guys, Judas is killing them all. It's a day of victory for the Jews. It's a day of defeat for our enemies. So he disobeyed the orders of Judas and he charged into battle and said, they are scared of us. And the enemy wiped him out. Because he thought it was a day of victory for the Jews. And he did not realize only God gives the victory. He thought it was a time the enemy was afraid. But God alone puts fear. And God alone gives victory to us. We can easily, with 3,000 men, defeat all our enemies without weapons on our side and only weapons on theirs. It's no difficulty at all. But when Judas the Hammer, the great fearless warrior, walked into the temple of God and he saw that it was desolate, and he saw that God was not being worshipped, that he was abandoned, and he saw that there was a false sacrifice, and that false sacrifice died, just like the new mass. The new mass is dead and dying. Only two kinds of people in the hometown, the dead and dying. That's the new mass. Only the dead and dying are there. He went into the temple and saw that they had this, this, this sacrifice to devils, this false sacrifice, and for a short time they went to it, and they just destroyed the temple, but then they departed from the false sacrifice, and it fell apart. The false sacrifices cannot last. And therefore, the desolation, the whole temple is filled with desolation, and the church now is filled with desolation. They gave us a new sacrifice. One of the great errors the priests even make today, the devil's final attack is against the family. No. The devil hates God. And why does the devil hate the family? Because it is created by God. Because it is the reflection of God. And the devil knows those words he hates very much. <coughs> the second commandment is like unto the first. And he hates God. And he hates to worship God. He hates the honor of God. He hates the goodness of God. He hates what God has created. Do not think you are so important that the devil can waste his hate on you. You're not worth it. Or waste his hate on me. I'm not worth it. We are made of nothing and not worthy of his hatred. And the devil is wiser than that. He hates God. God. And the only reason he hates me is because God is in me. And the image of God is in me. And the only reason he hates you is because God is in you. And the image of God is in you. And even the most wicked man on earth is a being formed in the image and likeness of God. 
And therefore the devil hates every single man, including those that are in mortal sin, including those that have given themselves over to himself completely. He hates them all because he hates God. And all warriors should understand. What are we fighting for? Who are we fighting against? What are we fighting against? Why is it that adultery is bad and we don't like it? Why is it that abortion is bad and we disapprove of it? And why is it that every sin against a neighbor is bad? Because it is not like unto God. God is not reflected in adultery. He is not reflected in murder. He is not reflected in, in a lack of charity to the neighbor. He is not reflected in lies. And wherever God is not reflected, this is bad. This is evil. And therefore we are against it. Hence, God created the world, which is very good. But then what did he do? He looked down and saw that it was good. His eyes must always be upon us. And if his eyes are not upon us, we cease to be good. So Judas went into the temple and he saw the destroyed temple of God. He fell flat on his face and he wept and there was a lamentation. He blew the trumpet and he sounded the alarm. He did not sound the alarm when he fought the enemy in the field of battle, but he sounded the alarm. And what is our duty in this crisis of the church? To sound the alarm. One of the great evils right now, for instance, fighting against the masks, these foolish masks, and fighting against the evil laws about the coronavirus. What does everyone say? These things are bad because they infringe upon human freedom. That's why they're bad. We forget that God made us in his image and likeness. And they're covering the image and likeness. We forget that the reason why the wicked laws of the new world order are bad is because they are against God and not because they are against man. If we try to defend the rights of man without God, it is simply another way to be a soldier of Satan. It's the devil fighting Beelzebub. It doesn't work, for they're both on the same side. We have to recognize that the crisis in America, the crisis of the New World Order, the crisis that is all around us, it is a crisis of faith, and not just for Catholics. It is a crisis of faith for all men. And God is angry. He says in the parable, in the gospel today, notice the parable, our Lord. We don't read during the nation, we treat the parable of the prodigal son. On that day, our Lord Jesus Christ stood up in front of sinners, and publicans. <clears throat> and he's told a parable to them. Today in the gospel it says, A Lord Jesus Christ stood in front of Pharisees and scribes. And he told a parable to them. My parable for the publicans and sinners is the parable of the prodigal son. And two other parables about God's mercy. Here is my parable about scribes and Pharisees. And my parable about the high priests who know not and love not God and who are whited sepulchers. I say a king sent servants in order to invite those scribes and those Pharisees and those whited sepulchers and those wicked priests to a wedding feast and they would not come and they would not come, and they would not come. And finally he said, you must come to the feast. And they killed the servants. That's what the scribes and the Pharisees did. That's what the wicked priests did. And the king became angry. And he sent an army, and he killed those murderers, and he burnt their city. Not all parables about our Lord Jesus Christ are nice. 
There are murderers, and they live in a city, and the city is called Pandemonium. It is the city of Satan, the city of Lucifer, and it is a city designed to build in order to wage war against God and his goodness. And whoever thinks that evil men are waging war against anything else, they are deceived. How do we fix the problem of immodest dress? How do we fix the problem of pornography? How do we fix the problem of broken homes? How do we fix the problem of drugs? How do we fix the problem of abortion and the contraception? How do we solve all these problems? God, God, and God. There is no other way. We must rebuild the temple. Now Judas Maccabeus went in on the 25th day of the month of Kaslu. That will be the day in which Jesus Christ decided to make himself visible to us as priest the first time. This is the day of the birth of Christ, 153 years later. <clears throat> 153 years after Judas Maccabeus purified the temple in one day. They did an all-night work vigil. We have all-night work vigils here. They did a heck of an all-night work vigil. They tore down the old altar. They cleaned out all the mess. They rebuilt a new altar. And then they offered the sacrifice. And what did Judas do when he offered that sacrifice? <laughs> and they went their garments, they fell on their faces, and Judas appointed men. He wanted priests without blemish. He asked a priest without blemish who were focused upon the law of God. Where is it here? And he chose priests without blemish, whose will was set upon the law of God. As we enter into the present fight, it is necessary that we will be priests without blemish. Yes, we must have the true faith. And we have to deny all the errors of Vatican II and all the heresies of modernism, which is the grand sewer of all false teaching. It is a grand collection of all lies. That's what St. Pius X tells us. Modernism is so wicked because it's the one place where all lies dwell. The one place where all heresies dwell. That's why modernism is so wicked. We hate it because it is the principal heresy against God. It contains in it all other heresies. So now we can read Pashendi. It's not that long of an encyclical. You can memorize it. The seminarians are required to study it twice in detail. So they have it memorized. It's easy to do, not hard. But what did Our Lady of La Salette say 150 years ago? In the 1840s, a little more than that, my priests have become cesspools of impurity. They are not without blemish. My priests have become cesspools of impurity, and in the 20th century, there shall come a great punishment. There shall be world wars. Wars across the entire world, and many millions will die. Why? Because of the impurity of priests. Because they are not without blemish. Look at all the great evils in the world. Who invented the Big Bang? Catholic priests. Who invented Protestantism? Catholic priests. The great evils and heresies of the world are founded by Catholic priests who abandon God. And what is the way they begin to abandon him? Luther said that he was impure and he lived in lust. And he could not control his lust. And he said, it's God's fault that I cannot control lust. God made me a slave to lust. And therefore, one does not need to have faith, to have virtue to go to heaven. Faith alone saves. Why did Luther say that? Because he was filled with lust. And he began the heresy of Protestantism. Why did Henry VIII start his religion? Because of lust. We're now in the great battle of God against Satan. We must recognize in our battlefield that we must hold the truth. We must love God. But that we must become priests without blemish. We must head into the battlefield 
without blemish. And Judas Maccabeus chose priests without blemish. The second book of Maccabees says there were scarcely 200 such priests. And he gathered them together. And they were the ones who were instructed, pick up the dirty stones and move them to an unclean place. And they threw them out. And they were the ones who had to rebuild the temple. And they were the ones who tore down the old altar. And they built a new altar exactly like the former altar because they followed the law of God. But it was not defiled. We must remember in our great battle to follow the great example of Judas Maccabeus, fear heresy. Fear not God not being first. This is what we should fear and nothing else. We should have lamentation because God is not known and loved and not lamentation because of other things. We cannot stop abortion by voting on it and saying the majority of American people are against it. We cannot stop abortion by putting the right kind of judges in the Supreme Court. We stop abortion by putting God first, by recognizing that God is God, and all that he created is good. One of the things he created is a little bitty baby, and a baby is the most beautiful thing, and a baby is good because he is seen by God, because he's created by God, and because he is meant for God. Don't murder that baby. But if we have babies that we do not think are created by God, and they are not meant for God, then they're not good anyway. So then what's the point in trying to stop the murder of them? Those who try to prevent the murder of babies, and the murder of widows and orphans, and the murder of euthanasia, and the wickedness going on throughout our world today, without God, they fail, they are failures, and they cannot be pleasing to God. We must break it clear. God is God, and God is first, and God is the reason why murder is wrong and why other things are wrong. And what are we supposed to do? Love God with our whole hearts, our whole mind, our whole soul. And this mind and heart and soul and body must be pure, <coughs> without blemish. And then we build the kingdom of Christ. So we pray to the Holy Mother of the Church to have priests without blemish who wage war, not only against heresy, but against impurity. Not the impurity of others, but the impurity of ourselves. Not only the impurity of the flesh, but the impurity of intention. There is our impurity of flesh that just always comes back. Do we do things for God? Do we do things for a neighbor? Or do we do things for ourselves? Those who immerse themselves in doing things for themselves will one day return. You can be holy and spiritual for a while, but will you stay holy? Will you stay spiritual? If God is not first, we collapse. As the Lord Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the world. But if the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? So we thank God that there's 21 men. He said one of the prophecy was made by a wise man, several wise men actually. He said, now the Father Pfeiffer has become Bishop Pfeiffer. We're going to get some real losers in the seminary. There's going to be real nuts, real crazy guys showing up. Well, they're here, the first batch. This is not the first time in history things have been like this. God has always chosen the fools to defeat the wise. He has always chosen the weak to defeat the strong. He is chosen this because he wants to make it very clear God alone gives the victory. He sometimes allows a few strong men in as long as it's clear that their strength brings no victory. So long as we remain faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, faithful to the church, and follow the great example of Matthias. Matthias of the 20th century was Archbishop Marcel of Fev. He stood up in the 1960s and he said, though all the world go with this modernist Rome and this modernism of the church, we know there's impurity, we know there's masons, we know there's murders and persecutions, but what is it that made him stand up as a priest of God? The abomination of desolation in the holy place called the new mass. 
and the abomination of false doctrine in our holy church and the desolation of our church. He saw the temple torn down. He saw the everything destroyed and he wept and he sounded the alarm. And he said, though all of Israel, all of the Holy Church, goes to this Vatican II modernism, I and my sons will not. We are sons of our sister the Fet. We continue the work of the Society of St. Pius X. And it is necessary that we not be defiled by the new mass and by the new doctrine. Now there are two ways of being defiled. One is to celebrate it ourselves. Remember 2012, 13, and 14, speaking to many of our fellow priests in the Society of St. Pius X. As long as I don't have to say the new Mass, I'm being obedient. As long as my superior doesn't command me to say the new Mass. It's a bit like telling a police officer, as long as I'm not told to rob a bank, I'm going to be a cop. You're not there to not rob banks. You're there to prevent bank robberies. You're there to capture bank robbers. Like a judge saying, I haven't told a lie in my life. I haven't personally told a lie. I haven't told anything bad. I've sent plenty of innocent men to die. I've never fulfilled my duty as a judge. I've never prevented evil. I've never punished it. But I have always paid my taxes. That is not a judge. We are priests of God. We must recognize that souls are going to hell because they're being led away from God. There will be many publicans and many sinners in the kingdom of heaven. And now we must go out to the highways and the hedges because those that are invited to the feast, they will not come. So we go to the highways and the hedges and we invite in all whom we find in order to come into the wedding feast for the wedding feast must be full. Go and get the publicans and get the sinners. Get the beggars on the side of the road. They are all welcome. But God is first. And when they come into the church... We'll be able to heal their drug problem. We'll be able to heal their impurity problem. We'll be able to heal their violence problem. We'll be able to heal all their difficulties, provided God is first. And if God is not first, all fails. But in any case, we follow the example of Judas Maccabeus. We read about it in the sacred scripture today. We read about it for this whole month of October. And today is the day he purified the temple. And 153 years later, on December 25th, the same day that Judas Maccabeus purified the temple, God the Son was born on Christmas. The same day when Jesus Christ came out of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He came out like Judas the Hammer. Now what were the orders he gave on that day? He said, take the unclean stones, throw them out. Find clean stones and make a new altar. Put up the veils and the curtains and bring in clean incense and bring in the clean oil and light the holocaust and there will be a sacrifice before the night has come. Tear down the, the altar which was used as an abomination though it is not damaged and put it in another place until the prophets tell us what to do with those stones. And find priests without blemish to go and do all these works. Sound the alarm. Weep. And send soldiers to the nearby castle and kill all the men in the castle that remained here that allowed this to be. He did all that in one day. And this is what Lord Jesus Christ did in one day. When he rose from the, when he was crucified on Good Friday, and when he came into this earth, he came on one day to show forth his priesthood, and this is the work of the priesthood. It was physical in the Old Testament, it is supernatural and spiritual in the New. But it is the same work we must do all these works as priests of God. And so the work is done. And so men, they cannot be done if we are not men without blemish. And so we pray the seminarians, and we pray for them, that as they travel through their years in the seminary, that they learn to fight true faith, purity of mind, the true faith, purity of heart, and the true faith of purity of flesh. And then, without blemish, we can go into the battle and defeat the enemies of God, having confidence only in Him, whether we have weapons or not. Those of you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.